been here a couple times before and I missed it. I apologize, but um, anyone, this is your very first time coming here. Alex, I know your first time. <laughs> All right, what is your name? Courtney. Courtney. Welcome. Have you been to New Sound before? Is this your first time? Uh, nope, first time ever. Okay, welcome. Yeah. It's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm sure, yeah, would love to get you connected. Um, Alex, I played basketball with Alex. Alex, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, I'm Alex. I went to New Sound. Yeah. Now you do what? You are, uh, <laughs> remind me of your occupation. Oh, what do I do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> software development. Software development, okay. Who, what was your name again? I know we met maybe once before. Me? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> My name is Helen, uh, and I just started attending New Song last year. Um, and, uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, to, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing we should need to celebrate is someone here got married recently, and her name is Carly. Carly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how's the married life so far? It's a work in progress. <laughs> 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 Ernest also got married a couple weeks ago. So we got um, just very briefly before we introduce uh, our guest speaker, Teddy, um, there's a couple things, a couple uh, really important announcements from some very important people. Um, but before I do that, I just want to announce, uh, and I'll announce this again at the end, next week we'll have our Christmas party. So it's our white elephant, uh, 10 to $15 gift range. Uh, next Thursday, next Friday, December 18th, we'll post it uh, at New Song Irvine. So if you guys remember that is the Teller building, we post all the information for that. So look out for that next week. It's usually like one of the highlights of our year is the is the Christmas party. Um, I don't know what, what were some of the crazy guests last year. Onesies. Onesies. The onesies, they're like the Superman onesies. Um, <laughs> I don't know who got that. I, I commit to putting in some live lobster. I'm gonna throw that in there this year. I think that's gonna be that's gonna be my contribution. This is a bunch of um, Peter Peter did live live fish one year. People got really upset about the live fish because like now you have to take care of the fish. <laughs> so at least the lobster you can eat that. You know, the whole fish. Um, <laughs> So we have two, two important guests making two important announcements. The first person is actually a good friend. He works here uh, literally in the same uh, building right down the hall. Uh, he has his own collaborative space. Many of you have already gone there. Um, it's a space to have space basically to do creative projects, to do photography, to do video stuff, uh, to come and you know just have a couple hours to use, to use the internet and, and, and uh, develop any kind of projects you have. He's also doing a special, I think it's a six week uh, program or a class teaching kind of how to be more creative for some of us that are a little more creatively challenged. And so I want to invite him up to share uh, a little bit more information. If you're interested, uh, please talk to Sam, but no further ado, here's Sam Song. We give him a, a welcome. to hang out and, and, and listen to an amazing story. Uh, yeah, so I have a space upstairs. It's called the studio. Uh, it's a place where it was kind of created to create a space, to create space for people to dream, to ideate, to do photo shoots, to build things, to program. There's been like churches that's been going in there doing the whole series planning for three days. Like it's just all kinds of, it's about the size, like half, a little smaller than this, but little space that's upstairs if you guys ever want to come check it out check it out um, you know for me like recently you know I stepped down from new song uh, as a pastor and, and began entering into this world of Santa Ana and really uh, being here as a creative um, and just really building relationships and doing work as a creative and what I've been realizing is that uh, one thing that I kind of miss is the community aspect of being a creative and so um, 
So I, I went to Joshua Tree for a silence and solitude retreat for my, by, by myself, which Ed Salas taught me very well how to do. And in that time, I just felt like God said, do this. And so I'm um, doing just a quick six-week cohort, which is cohorts are usually just community learning. It, it's not me telling you, like, here's the answers to life. It's just like, hey, I'm a creative, you're a creative. What does it mean to be a creative and thrive as a creative? Uh, I make a living as a creative. And actually, I'm doing pretty well right now, so I'm very happy. But, um, but I think there's something to be said about sharing that experience and the learning together. So it's just a simple six-week cohort. Uh, we meet every Tuesdays from 6.30 to 8.30. Um, it's very limited space, so you actually have to apply and tell me why. It's free, but there is a deposit, because if you flake, you lose a deposit. So we're trying to make it really serious. And the idea behind it is really for us not to just dream and just you know, explore the possibilities for actually create. And so by the end of the six weeks, the goal is to be done with something, uh, whether it's a business, business or a project or something. And I feel like something about community is really important to keep the accountability level really high. And so you know, for those who don't know me, you know, you know, I've been a creative pastor at Utah for a very long time. Um, and then when we moved over, I just felt God in that in that fourth street market saying it's time for me to launch out and into the back into the world of the creative. And so I've been kind of doing that and I've been working at Angels and Dodgers and UCI and I'm making films and I'm doing all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and I feel like it's he didn't send me out just for me to just enjoy it, but to bring it back to my community, which is like us at Utah, and I just kind of share the journey together. So hmm. if you're interested, uh, I'll be here. I'm going to hang out quite to the end. Um, but talk to me. You guys will see me on Sunday. Come grab me. You guys know who I am, I think. Um, or would you ask him for my contact? Is that good? That's great. Thanks, good. Sam. Hi. Bye. <laughs> A uh, few friends of us were at the Dodger game a number of months ago, and we're just there, we have great seats, and we're just enjoying the game. We're like, hey, is that Sam on the field? He's running around, and then, and then we see him, and he goes, he goes, hey, he goes, you know, where are you sitting? We're sitting right here. Around the sixth or seventh inning, I get a text saying, hey, you're going to be on TV right now. Stand up. And we're like, what? Like, where is he? Where is he? And then all of a sudden, little do we know, we're like on the big screen. And so basically, Sam is one of the directors for the photography for Dodgers and for Angels. And he has like godly power where he can see everyone in the stands and like literally be like, we'll get you on TV. So <laughs> that was one of the coolest moments of my entire life. Like, when you have a friend that can literally get you on the, the Jumbotron where like 40,000 people can see, that's a pretty. Pretty good friend to have. And it's a great good. way to propose. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> make sure, <laughs> make sure she's going to say yes. I was $5,000 and told my double All right, so next we have another important guest. Um, uh, Pastor Ed, you guys remember his series on healthy relationships a couple weeks ago. He did a two-week series, and it really impacted our community. There's a lot of people still talking about it to this day. But uh, Ed's here to share with us on a service opportunity uh, in Irvine, but it's for uh, the children of Santa Maria. So uh, give it up for Pastor Ed. Good to see you guys. So this will be fairly brief. Let me tell you the quick story. We have a family in our church, the Lou's. Ross and Sylvia Liu, and they have a little daughter. And they live in a nice part of Irvine. They provide nice things for their daughter. She plays club soccer. But what happens when you're little like that, you grow really fast, the stuff gets worn for a few months and they outgrow it, right? And he was thinking to himself, man, there's a lot of kids in Santa Ana that would love to wear a soccer uniform or have this kind of equipment or have soccer shoes but I bet they don't have the resources to get that. And he really wanted to give back. And he said to me one day, uh, what could we do? And he began to dream out uh, something about how can we get kids the soccer equipment, especially stuff that is barely used. He approached uh, Lambert and I. This Saturday, there are over 300 teams in a tournament all over uh, Irvine. 
in about 25 fields. A lot of them are grouped really close together, um, but here's what we're going to do. It's called Jammers uh, Youth, um, it's like a Jammers Youth Soccer Tournament. We're going to take bins to these locations. They, all the parents have been notified already, and a lot of them are going to bring their kids youth stuff. And the bins for those, I've actually brought bins. Some of you have already taken bins. Tonight I know uh, Anthony and Kaya are gonna jump, out, jump on board. But if there were three or four other people that could help, we still have a total of about 14, 15 locations. And uh, so three more people plus those two, we can handle it. Some of them went out on Sunday, by the way. So we have other volunteers. I'm wondering, if besides uh, Kaya and Anthony, there are three or four others that would be willing from, from either, there's two, there's either an eight, eight o'clock start, where registration will start right before eight, or a 9.30 start, depending on if those fields have lights, because then those will play later, so they'll start a little bit later. So it'll be those two start times, and you'll be done at about 12.30, one o'clock. And you don't have to sit and babysit bins. You set them up, and you can kind of do stuff, you can watch games, you can meet parents, and then just gather the stuff and just bring it to 1010 on Sunday. Just like that, real easy. Are, those, are there three or four people that will join Anthony and Kaya tonight to take some bins? I have directions, I have addresses, I've got the posters that are going to go with the bins. And anybody that would do that? Okay. Well, how about Kaya and Anthony? Why don't you meet me over here? And if there's three others that will come up part of this, then we're just gonna do, I'm just going to give it to you really quick. And if three or four others come, then my Saturday morning, I won't be too crazy. We don't have the rest of it on the time. All right. Thank you very much. Can you say a date and a time? One this time. Saturday? This Saturday, two days from today, about 8 a.m. in the morning to about 12.30 in the afternoon. Okay? Okay, so if you're interested now, you can either go and, and grab a bin right now. If you're interested later, you can talk to Anthony or Kaya or myself, and we could get you connected before Saturday. Okay, sound good? All right. All right, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce uh, our guest speaker for tonight, Teddy, Teddy Z. Um, Teddy has been a friend ever since I first got here, April 2008. We were at... Chosan Kaibi, and we were grabbing dinner. I didn't know Teddy at all, uh, but there was a mutual friend of our stream who had known me and invited me out for dinner. She wasn't, I don't think she was actually at the dinner, but she invited me. And uh, we start talking, we go around. I think our friend Lauren was there, other people were there, and somehow Teddy and I talk, and he says, he, he found out I was in seminary. He said, hey, hey guys. He stands up, he says, hey. This guy's in seminary. He's going to pray for us. And I was like, what? I just got to LA. I don't know anyone. The person that invited me to dinner wasn't there. And now I'm praying at Chosen Kyrie for this dinner. And I'm like, okay. I'm about to pray. And he goes, hey, let's hold hands. I'm like, what? All right. So I'm praying for a bunch of people that I don't know at a Kyrie restaurant. And we pray. And I say just like a nervous short prayer. And that was my beginning of how I met Teddy. And, uh, and that was the story of the last seven years. And after that time, we got to know each other a little bit. Uh, he would invite me out to different parties and gatherings and barbecues. And Stephen, uh, a friend of ours, Stephen Liu, there's an organization called Apex, which he helped start a number of years ago. Uh, he would invite me out to uh, basically be at this uh, Fourth of July party. At the Fourth of July party, no one would, uh, no one wanted to be at the barbecue. So here I am. It's my first kind of first couple months in LA, and I say, say to Steve Lou, "Hey, thanks for inviting me to the party. How about I just take care of the barbecue?" And so I sit there, and all these cool people like started coming by the barbecue area, um, and that that was my my baptism by fire into LA. And after I met all those people that came to get Kyrie at the barbecue station. They started inviting me to their parties and their gatherings, and the rest is history where I made so many friends, and it really was through um, meeting Teddy, uh, his friend Steve, good friend Steven, and that was kind of the way that I got introduced to LA and um, really got connected with a lot of my close friends here. So I have a lot to thank you for, Teddy. Um, Teddy, uh, rather than reading off a bio of everything that he, he did, I, I posted it on the Young Adult page. Um, 
He was a Hollywood, Hollywood producer uh, with Paramount Pictures, uh, with Columbia, is that correct? With um, Overbrook, uh, worked a lot with Will Smith on the production of the movie Hitch. The movie, uh, anyone seen the movie Hitch? Right. Still remember the, the scene with Kevin, Kevin James where they're like, do I go 80% or 20%? <laughs> you remember that scene? I'm not gonna like uh, act that out. <laughs> um, another, uh, another film that I saw in your bio, Teddy, was My Girl. You were a part of that one? I mean, that shows how old I am, but My Girl was like, what? Like, Macaulay Culkin dies? What? Like, I was so shocked. <laughs> it was like in 1991, so get over it. <laughs> um, everyone who died that being a big, big moment. Um, Teddy, <laughs> Teddy also helped um, bring Chow Young back, if you know him from Crashing Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Helped him on one of his first film projects. I'll have a chance to talk about that. But honestly, the real reason, it's not about the, the bio stuff as much as it's about um, Teddy, uh, basically, in the last year or so, he's uh, come to faith. He's come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I've been uh, blessed so much by hearing his story and being encouraged by him in that way. So we're going to, uh, there's no set format of how we're going to do this tonight, but we're going to probably go through maybe how uh, Teddy and his family came to America, and also we'll go through a little bit of the Hollywood journey. We'll go through a little bit of the faith journey, and we'll try to wrap it back up. Um, we'll also, if we have time, we'd love to, for you to be thinking about maybe questions. Uh, what does it look like for someone that maybe uh, is non-Christian to come to faith? What does it look like for that? What does it look like for the church maybe to reach out to people that uh, aren't Christian and, uh, and maybe don't have interest in church? Um, Teddy grew up in somewhat of a, a Buddhist background, so some of you guys might have a backgrounds with that in your families. And so with no further ado, I want to invite up my good friend Teddy Z. was I was in Seoul, Korea, in the bathroom, listening to the Asian America podcast with Ken, uh, with Ken Fong. And as I listened to it, I started to tear up because I didn't know this, the full story of your life, the full story of your background, the full story of kind of the ups and downs of Hollywood, and then ultimately um, I had heard from Sun Mo, our good friend, that you, know, you had given your life to Christ um, and gotten baptized, but I didn't hear the full story from your voice. And at that moment, I thought, oh my goodness, uh, not only do I need to talk to Teddy, but this would be such a blessing for other people to hear your story as well. So um, I think it would be great to start from the beginning, uh, kind of even in the, the Ken Fong podcast about childhood growing up, uh, your parents being immigrants to uh, the States, and and we'll go from there. Sure. Um, so I, I'm 58 years old, and I grew up in upstate New York, uh, town of Liberty, um, 5,000 people, three Asian families. Um, my father uh, and mother grew up in China. Uh, they were pretty poor. My mother, if she were alive today, she'd be 100 years old. And she uh, had her feet bound. And this was at a time when bound feet were already outlawed, but because they lived in the sticks, never caught up. And she was uh, six years older than my dad, and she was arranged to marry him when he was 13. She was 19, and she ended up raising uh, my two aunts, and she had bound feet, and she really couldn't walk. And uh, so it was really modest beginnings. My dad had a second grade education. My mom never went to school. And uh, for some reason, my dad was a genius. He, he uh, enlisted in the US Navy after the war ended, World War II. And because of that, he qualified for citizenship in the United States. So he came to the US in 1949 to escape communism. And he taught himself how to 
read and speak English and got a job bussing tables on the Jersey Shore and um, just moved to upstate New York. It was uh, the Catskills, which was the home of the, uh, Jewish resorts. It was known as the Borscht Belt. Borscht is uh, like a beet juice. And so I grew up in this small town uh, surrounded by white people and Jews. And uh, my dad, um, at his peak earning years, made $16,000 a year. He worked in the kitchens, came home every night smelling like fish. And my mother just was a mom and never left the house. Uh, I had two brothers and a sister, and I was the baby. Now, um, I grew up uh, with parents who were always depressed and stressed and just trying to survive. Um, and they taught me that the most important thing was to survive and almost like fake it till you make it, you know? They didn't want me to be Chinese. They wanted me to be, to be American. So I, I just immersed myself in, in learning English by watching TV and movies and reading comic books and just used that as the great escape that uh, I, I basically traveled the world through television and never even got on an airplane until I went to college. And I, I, I had a lot of uh, trauma in my life. Uh, my father was abusive. My mother was abusive. I remember uh, um, she would get freaked out and she would put me on a washing machine like when I was four years old so I'd stop crying and put a bag over my head and say she was gonna light it on fire unless I stopped. And I remember like, finally coming to grips with that kind of behavior as an adult and telling my brothers and they said, I, I said, I never told anybody this. And they said, well, we know. I said, how do you know? They said, we, we, we watched this happen. And each of them had a story. And I'm telling the story not to tell you how terrible my parents were, but, but how much stress they were under. And my dad, in fact, he was so stressed that he held me underwater out of anger. And uh, you know, it's something that I carry with me for my entire life. So, but the great thing is, they worked hard, they gave me a life, they gave me a great opportunity, and because of my dad, I got a scholarship, full scholarship, he put four of us to college, and we all made everybody proud, and uh, the one thing was, we all just wanted to survive. And what I realized was I was faking everything. I remember I was probably like seven years old. And here's this Chinese family <coughs> celebrating Christmas. And we didn't even know what Christmas was. I mean, Christmas was a tree and giving presents and singing songs. But I had no concept of what Christmas was. And I remember as a seven-year-old, or whatever age I was, thinking, who are these people? I, I actually felt like an out-of-body experience watching me and my family and saying, our family is just acting the part of what a family is supposed to be. And we didn't really know how to express ourselves. We didn't know how to express love for one another. The way we, my parents expressed love was feeding us. And uh, my religious training was my waking up every morning to hearing my mom with prayer beads in the attic as a Buddhist and telling me not to worry that her prayers covered the entire family. So I was raised really modestly. I, I uh, lived a lot of shame. Uh, I was thought that I was embarrassed of being Chinese. Uh, I was embarrassed of being poor. I always thought that I didn't fit in any, anywhere. And it was all um, 
wasn't true. But I had convinced myself of that because of how my parents saw the world. And I vowed that I would break out of that. I would lead a, a real American life. Uh, you know, I had big dreams. And the one thing that television taught me was anything was possible. So uh, my entire life, I've been really lucky to be in the right place at the right time during the right moments in history. Um, starting in the film business when, uh, when there weren't even DVDs, VHS was just coming out. Uh, you know, it was like the go-go years when you were going to work in China before all the doors were coming out. You know, being immersed in technology right when the technology explosion happened. So, you know, I, I for somebody who started uh, nowhere, I was pretty naive to think that anything could happen. And my stupidity or ignorance really was one of the greatest gifts I've ever, ever been given. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm making it sound so dramatic. My life is probably no different as a child than many of yours, but I'm a storyteller, so it's how I remember it. Um, but I did feel alienated most of my life. I felt like I didn't belong, even with my own family, where I couldn't speak Chinese well, so even communicating with my parents was a real chore. Uh, so that's, that's basically my family. Yeah, I think maybe a lot of people can resonate with the idea that in a lot of our families, we would have liked to have those more vulnerable conversations to be able to share openly. Um, but a lot of times there wasn't always that reciprocation. Um, I'm, I'm curious, and I remember from the, the podcast, um, what were some of those early jobs? I remember you mentioned you used to work at the hotel. Um, and what, maybe some, what were the, some of the lessons you were learning as you were working these different jobs? Money. Money drives the world. That's the number one thing. I worked as a caddy starting at, I think, 11. And it was at this fancy resort. I thought it was fancy. And as an 11-year-old, who was probably 4'11", I would carry two bags. And I knew that I could get a cart and pull it. But my tip would not be as good if I had a cart. So everybody would feel sorry for this shrimpy kid carrying two bags, 18 holes. It was a lesson I learned. It's capitalism. I, I worked as a, uh, a stock boy in the grocery store. I pumped gas, uh, bus boy. And then my big job was as a bellhop. And it was the same principle. Don't get a cart, carry everything. And, I, and I, I realized, when I first got that job, I said, one day, I'm going to be able to make enough money so I can stay in a hotel like this. And then by the time I graduated college, on my last day of work there, I said, one day, I'll make enough money so I won't have to vacation in a dump like this. Mm -hmm. So everything is about your perspective. You know, I, I remember growing up and thinking my house was so huge. And I, I went back for a high school reunion and I saw it and it was, I was embarrassed. You know, when you're a little kid, your perspective is wow. But now I look at it and it, it was a shack. But. Did you have any early dreams at that time? You mentioned, you know, watching TV and kind of starting to think of maybe leaving, going on to these dreams. Things. The only dreams I had was, wow, I wish I could date a girl like Charlie's Angels or like Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I, I just wanted to get a job where I could make a living watching my dad. So I got a job at NBC in human resources and personnel. And it was in New York City. So they, they actually transferred me to Burbank. And that's where I realized I used to watch NBC. There were three channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and I was And I was in the building 
were all these shows that I watched, they were me. And I, as a kid, you don't think about that. And I was like, wow, it's like the, there's somebody on the third floor who decides the taste of America. And I had an opportunity to meet with the president. Um, and I said, how does somebody get a job like this? It just, I, I couldn't even imagine. And he went into this long story, but all I heard was, I went to Harvard Business School. So, and right after that, I went off and I said, I gotta have this job. I applied to Harvard Business School. And I was able to get in. And my grades were not that great. I was a 3.3. But I can tell that I was a pretty good storyteller back then. And from watching TV all the time. And I got into Harvard Business School. And I literally almost flunked out. The first three months there, I went with the purpose of coming back out to getting a creative job. But while I was there, I got a little bit seduced and intimidated because everybody was going to go work on Wall Street or consulting, and, and they looked so sophisticated and so moneyed, and I, I started getting sucked into that. And I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was in the bottom 5% for the first semester. And I said, screw this. I, I, I'm, I can never do this. I'm just going to watch TV all day. And I ended up watching TV all day. And then I went back to class every day. And everything clicked. And because I had the burden placed, taken off of me, um, I ended up soaring and graduated comfortably. And the thing I learned most of all about Harvard Business School was not case study, was not finance. What I learned was in every section, there are like 10 sections, there are 90 people. There's one person, genius, just mind-boggling, computer-like. But usually that person had no interpersonal skills and was borderline. And then there, were, <laughs> then there were 15 people who um, I can't imagine how they got into Harvard Business School. And everybody else was sort of just like me. And I said, wow, if this is supposed to be the best and the brightest, it, it made me feel like I can do this. I can do anything. So I came back out, and I met with the president. And I said, here I am. I got my MBA from Harvard. And he said, who are you again? And he doesn't remember any of this. And me being naive and stupid, I, I went out and did it. But it turned out to be lucky because I was able to market myself as being somebody different. That I was like a Louis Vuitton's accessory for a you know hotshot studio executive. And I, I got a job. My first job in Hollywood was as a creative executive with a parking space, an expense account, and a secretary. The first month on the job, I met Tom Cruise and uh, Eddie Murphy and all these great directors, and it was a dream come true. And it fit into my philosophy of dream big, follow your passion, and great things can happen. Um, I remember. Um, can you talk about this? What makes a good story? I know that's something that you're really passionate about. Uh, a beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> <laughs> and having people want to hear more. It's not how much you give, it's how little you give to get the response you want. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I just made it up. <laughs> As you kind of moved your way into Hollywood, uh, how did that initial sort of maybe couple years go? And um, what were your initial thoughts or observations or kind of where were you headed in that, in that time? When I was in Hollywood, I, I, uh, when I started, uh, I was pretty arrogant, I think. I, uh, I thought I was a hot shit. Um, I acted that way. Acted like I was the smartest person in the room, and uh, in 
inside, I was frightened. Inside, I thought that the fraud police would show up at any moment and arrest me for being a poser. So all these people, all I, I'd be in a room and I'd just see everybody, you know, being friendly with everybody and having great relationships. And I felt like an outsider. And I, I felt like an outsider my entire life. So even though I felt like an outsider, I had been equipped by my parents to know how to survive it. So I played the role. I knew how to act like I knew what I was talking about. I knew how to act like I was friendly with people. And it was stressful. You know, for being having the dream job and thinking I was happy, I had so much turmoil inside. I had so much of a disconnect between who I thought I was and who I was projecting to be. And I gotta tell you, that's the worst formula for, maybe a okay formula for monetary things, but it's the worst formula for personal happiness or satisfaction or just freedom. And I just felt trapped. Just Now, I can look back and tell you that I felt trapped. At the time, I probably thought I had it made. But I knew that I was living a lie. And so living a lie became my life. And living a lie became my life and my personal life, too. So I became the perfect husband, the perfect father, and I was anything but. I was uh, an adulterer. Uh, I was just a user. I, I used people. I used women. I used men. Uh, I got into relationships. I, I took them out of affairs. I, <coughs> I visited prostitutes. Uh, I, I, I patted myself on the back because I never needed my position. But Boy, that's a, that's a terrible compilation. That's a terrible way to bolster your, your, your integrity by saying, I never did that. But, so I, it, I, I, uh, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And uh, at the time, I, I realized I was in a lot of denial and a lot of pain. And I didn't even know who I was. And it ruined my marriage. And... Um, didn't ruin my career, but I just was not happy and um, started drinking a lot and uh, trying to lose myself. Um, as I think of you share, I wonder like, if you were able to go back and maybe say something to yourself during that time, is there anything that maybe, maybe could have convinced uh, you know, I, I change or uh, ask for help or something. I didn't know how to ask for help. Um, I just want to um, part of when you're living a lie to ask for help meant exposing yourself, uh, meant being vulnerable, and means getting caught. So I was running my entire life, and. Um, I actually think uh, I wouldn't change anything at all. I mean, I'm sorry for the people I hurt, but I actually think that it was an incredible gift that I was given, that I've gone on, you know, you said I have an amazing story, and I'll tell you, I, I was, yeah, but I'm here today in front of 50 young Christians telling my story. And I wouldn't have a story to tell, and I wouldn't be a Christian in the way I love Jesus without having gone through everything I've gone through. And I really believe that God's plan for me is something great. And it's not about me achieving anything. It's about me being real and vulnerable and sharing my experience. And maybe, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're all Christians, but the greatest gift is helping people, whether they're Christian or not, but if they're not Christians, leading them to the Lord and giving them an operating system 
it helped them cope with a crazy world. And yeah, I, I wish I wish somebody had had embraced me and taught me the gospel. And, but I don't think I was ready for it. I just I I just wasn't ready for it. I I, I thought my way was the right way. And, Took. It took having my world crash and for me to wander and be alone and commit, thinking about committing suicide, for me to, to really hit rock bottom and to surrender. So every day I'm grateful that I'm here and now I have somebody to guide me and I don't have the burden of having to figure out all the answers in life. And I have so many people that I can share my love with and who can teach me. And I'm a baby. I, I'm, I'm a, I was found uh, a year ago Thanksgiving. And I think it's a miracle that I'm here today. And um, I don't want to waste that miracle. You know? And I, I, it's so amazing what, what God's plan has been. And I'm so uncomfortable with the vocabulary, but I, I just have to tell you in my way that, um, so my, I, I fell in love with a woman, and uh, I met her in Korea, and Stephen knows her. She's the most beautiful woman in the world. And for me to get not a second chance or third, it's like my thousandth chance in life, okay? And I knew she was the one, and we've been together for eight years. And I, I believe God put her in my life as training us to learn about love and to learn to be vulnerable and learn to surrender to someone else first. And she had come from a Christian family but had lapsed and she never wanted to go to church. And her parents objected to having her date me, divorced, entertainment business, older than her. And not a Christian. So they always would call her and say, did you go to church? And she would lie. And I said to her, let's not lie, let's just go to church. And we went to church and I would be on my phone or I would fall asleep or whatever. And she would, we just went on for like six months and then we lapsed again. And, and, uh, and then I, uh, last Thanksgiving, she uh, went to Virginia your sister. They had been praying for us for seven years. And she had somebody who was speaking in tongues and had prophesied me. And she said to Julia that God had a plan for her. And for some reason, this time, that plan took hold. And the two sisters came to me and they said, Do you have any problem with Julia? becomes a Christian again. And I it was the happiest day of my life. Because I think the last 10 years of my life, I've been preparing to become a Christian. And I opened my arms and we became Christian. And the time was impeccable because two weeks later, She came home from dinner and she had terrible pain. So it was a Thursday. We, we went to the emergency room. And they did tests and said, ah, it's just the flu, you know, here's some medicine, go home. Friday it gets worse. Just make it through the week. So Saturday, Sunday, she's in excruciating pain. We go to the emergency room. They do test. Her appendix burst. But it had burst already. Mm -hmm. So it was now five days later. And my best friend was a surgeon. And I called him up to come take a look. And he came out to me. And I, I thought it was over. He was so uh, scared for me. But oddly enough, I wasn't afraid. So I opened up the Bible and I 
prayed. And I prayed with my wife. We made it through. I mean, it took a couple months. But God found us in time to have us make it through. And I'm just so grateful. It was a great test. It brought us closer. It brought us closer to each other. It brought us closer to God. And uh, I remember it was Christmas, Christmas Eve. And uh, I called our mutual friend, Sun Mo. And Sun Mo is a guy who's a real Christian. And I say that because every time I see him, he would have that big grin on his face and those open arms. And I just wanted to run the other way. Because I knew there was something there. But who's the first person I call on Christmas Eve? And he said, Oh, I'm, I'm not doing it. Can I come to the hospital? So he came to the hospital and brought his Bible. And we spent Christmas Eve in the hospital praying. And it was surreal because as much as I wanted to be a Christian before, I think I needed Julia to have this near-death experience to really surrender, completely surrender and give myself. And I have so much gratitude because how we made it through was because of his comfort and his grace. And it's just been amazing. It's really been amazing. Um, I remember that time that you were going out to visit churches and, and everything. And I remember you sharing that with me, like you going with Stephen and with with Linda, and you guys go out different places. Like, um, I think a lot of us we need to learn as as now you, uh, us all as Christians. But at that time, were there any maybe critiques or things that you saw about the church that were like? Oh, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, man, this is uh, you know, not necessarily in a, such a negative way, but oh, I think there's some things that we need to learn as Christians that maybe we're a little bit oblivious to because we've been, some of us have been in this culture for a long time. Well, um, very personal in finding the right church. And we church shop for a long time. And uh, I really thought that maybe taking six months to shop for a church might have been a little excessive. Maybe it was my way of not committing to something. Um, but I need great music. Um, that's not the biggest thing, but I want, I want great worship. And uh, I also wanted, um, we went to a couple of big churches with an older congregation and uh, very academic, and I used to listen to podcasts from uh, John MacArthur is his church, uh, his pastor up at his church. I would listen to him religiously and then go listen to him to his church. So I, I just shopped around a lot. But um, what I really wanted was more. And the problem was that my wife had other standards, what she thought being a Christian. And we would get into arguments. Because she would sit down and she would show me videos about hell and what hell looked like, and that I needed to do certain things, I needed to earn my way into heaven. And I was just starting to read the Bible, and I thought, my understanding is different than that. My understanding is it's not meritocracy, you, all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then you're going to go to heaven. And then if you do it with all your heart, you want to walk with Jesus. You want to live a certain way. <laughs> but it's not a requirement. Now, I had changed my life. I wasn't going out drinking, wasn't going out doing crazy things. And uh, I was praying. And so I needed help. So I reached out to Sunday and Carl, another friend who passed his kid. And he had done Bible study for seven years at this place. So I said, Dad, I, I, I'm, I'm needing help. So we met as a little group for 12 weeks. And I felt guilty because I was using these guys to just soak up as much 
of the gospel as I could. And uh, it was an accountability for the church. And um, I remember we were outside at a coffee shop. And uh, my friend Sungo had Paul, he was, his face had frozen, he was paralyzed. And um, he was always so given, but he was always hiding. He, he wouldn't let himself be open to others, even though he was so giving and loving. That was his thing. And my thing was I wanted greater humility. You know, I really wanted to surrender. So we're, here we are. And that day was a crazy day because we were about six sessions into our group. And no matter where Sungmo sat, the sun was shining on. And over the course of our six weeks, he had, he had been cured. And we had prayed for him constantly. And that same day, while we were praying, I asked God to make me more humble. And I asked for a miracle. I want a sign. And so they're all praying. And at that very moment, a bird flies over and dumps on my back. <laughs> Coincidence or a miracle? <laughs> okay, so, so we have Sungmo, who was teaching me everything, and, and, and Carl, who was the pastor's kid. So I'm fraternally grateful to them. And we ended up starting a, a Bible study with seven people, and now it's grown to over 40 people. And that's at my place. But this is how God works in such mysterious ways. I, I'm sucking all the love out of these guys. I'm learning everything, and I'm basically telling them, I love Jesus so much, I just want to go to the top of any mountain and scream how much I love him. And it's probably sickening. It's like the first love, and it's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But these guys have told me that through my newfound faith, they have renewed their love for Jesus. That they have taken things for granted, and they're seeing him in a new light, and that through me, they're appreciating it and reevaluating it, because as a pastor's kid, and there are like five PKs in my Bible study, lifelong Christians who spent most of their time pushing away from the church, rather than embracing it, and they look at me, who Five years ago, all they could remember me as in a drunken stupor of being the life of the party. Now, just embracing the gospel, just unabashedly. You know? And uh, so, and it calmed me down because I always felt guilty of them taking so much from them. They assured me that it's a, a renewing of their faith. Um, Kind of as you reflect back on maybe, uh, well, I remember you sharing this, like the role of a producer. And when you shared what the role of a producer was, I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty much in line with uh, the Apostle Paul when he says, like, this, the, I, the, the purpose of the church is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, that is, to actually empower people to go out and serve in the world where the real action is, where, where God needs to be, you know, where God desires to be kind of, uh, you know, this idea of go out and make disciples of all men. Where Jesus, that was his mission, to empower people to go out. And I remember you saying the role of the producer is actually pretty well, similar. My, you know, I, I was a control freak. I need to be in charge of everything. Over the last 10 years, I realized that I'm no longer the driver of a passenger. Maybe I'll help navigate a little bit. But it really, the last few years of my life, my, my philosophy about my role in life has been very clear. And that is, my role is to help other people make their dreams come true. That, that if I can help people learn from what I went through, that most of the time, the thing that holds you back more than anything is yourself. So whether you're a producer, a director, a writer, an actor, or a business person, a CEO of a startup, a, uh, anybody, it's about 
lifting the limits and equipping you with the spirit and the inspiration to to truly go for what God is intended for. And I realized that the final piece of the puzzle is actually being a Christian. That that, that helps you um, become balanced and equips you with how to deal with everything. And uh, so I do want to help make disciples both in family's inspiration, but also in faith. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's asked this question before, but are there stories in the Bible as you start to read it, or as you've been hearing stories, or you know, looking at the life of Christ? Are there is there a particular story that's like, wow, that one really resonates with with me, whether right now or maybe a story in your life? But are there any particular stories that stand out as you maybe read them afresh that are like, wow, that those, that, um, one, that particular one? I can't recite the exact passage, mm-hmm. but I think everybody knows the woman at the well, the <laughs> American woman who has to go to the well at noon or during the middle of the day when the rest of the town goes early in the morning when it's cool and Jesus is there. And even the the disciples, they question, why are you talking to her? And I felt like that woman. I felt like that woman who was so ostracized and shamed that she had to go to the well by herself. And... uh, Nobody would talk to her, that she didn't fit in, but that Jesus saw the worth in her and the beauty in her and uh, gave her love. So to me, that's, you know, it's so fine. Um, I think about um, the work that you've done uh, in the Asian American community over the last many, many years, whether it's championing people, uh, doing Asian American films, Championing actors, the John Cho's, the the other actors, actresses that you've championed over the years to kind of rise up to these different platforms. Um, a lot of us here are Asian Americans, some of us are not. But I think we, we would all benefit from just your thoughts on what is what does it mean to be Asian American, and what does it mean to maybe uh, be proud of that. You have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I have so many Asian American friends, young people, who have passion to be in the entertainment business. So it's two things. They all want to wave the Asian American flag, and they all feel like they have to earn it. And for me, it's very clear. Your parents taught you the wrong things if you want to be in the entertainment business. It's not about earning things. It's about having the imagination to dream big and go for it. That's, everybody has a camera. Everybody can post their own videos. Everybody, you are in control of that. So why you think you have to go step by step, it's crazy. You know, become Michelle Phan, become Kev Jumbo, become John Cho. Go for it. So that's number one. Number two, when you walk in a room and you're Asian American, they know you're Asian American. (laughs) It's your responsibility to show them that you're not Asian American, that that isn't what defines you. You, What defines you is I'm Gene and I have a brain and I'm creative and I want, when you look at me, I want you to see beyond that. But so many Asians walk in the room and say, yeah, I want to do this because it's my heritage. And it's like, dude, don't do that. <laughs> don't go into the Asian American ghetto. <laughs> the Asian American ghetto, we all want to tell universal stories, but we all want to tell our own experiences. But, you know, I'm telling you, from a practical experience, Nobody cares about Asian Americans, not even other Asian Americans. (laughs) They care about, hey, you want to tell a Korean story or Chinese story? No problem. But Chinese people, Korean people, Vietnamese people, they don't care about Asian Americans. That experience is, is to them, has no bearing. And the other thing is, 
Entertainment business is hard, not because you're Asian. Ask your white friends. They're all struggling, too. Anybody who wants to be a writer, director, actor, producer, it's hard. Don't use being an Asian as the excuse. Use being Asian as a reason to want to do more or try harder. So those are my, um, I'm, although I'm from a different generation, I feel like all my interests are the same interests as yours, with the exception of Periscope and Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I, I'm gonna have one more question for Teddy, but um, I wanna open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so be thinking about that. I'm gonna ask him one more question, and then we'll go. I know, I'm sure there must be some thoughts, uh, that personal questions that you guys might have, but um, maybe just a last fun question would be, Teddy, what was your most, uh, the film project that was maybe a favorite of yours, maybe, Big one, like a big, big Hollywood production that was your favorite, and maybe a personal one that uh, maybe was one that you had really kind of championed from the ground up. There's, there's a couple. So first off, um, I'm really proud of a movie that was a terrible movie. It was called The Replacement Killers, and the reason is because it starred this actor Chow Yun Fat, and he was from Hong Kong and a superstar in Asia. And I saw a movie that was directed by John Wu called The Killer. And this was, this was before many of you were born. And I saw this movie and my jaw dropped because I got a man crush on this guy. <laughs> the sexiest man alive, I don't care if he was Asian, white, black, green, or yellow. Guy was like mesmerizing. He was so cool, whether he had the gun in his hand or not. And I said, I, I just have to bring him to Hollywood. So I reached out to them and I, I set up a meeting. He flew in from Asia and I said, my goal is to embrace my Asianness because of you. I'm now proud to be Chinese because I can see people who I wish I looked like. And <laughs> I want to make you a Hollywood star. And that was his first film in Hollywood. And I'm really proud because my intentions were exactly what I stated and I accomplished that. So that was number one. Number two, Hitch, just because it was mm. so much fun working in New York with all these wonderful actors and great nightlife in New York, living in New York on an expense account in a hotel and having every door open to you, I gotta admit it was, it was great. And it was a fun movie. And it was one of those movies that, when we tested it, you know, every movie after you make it, you go to a test screening and you have open scores. And the first screening, you know, I was a little critical of it. And then we tested it, and it had the highest score ever for any movie that ever tested. And it was both good news and bad news. It was very gratifying, but I wanted to make more changes. But because it was tested so good, directors in the way. And then um, the last one is a movie called Saving Face. It's an uh, uh, Asian American director uh, who's a lesbian. It's a personal story of hers and that also helped me with my embracing my culture and returning back to being Asian. So uh, they're all my children, but those are my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how about this one, uh, real quick? So, working with actors, what what were some good things about it? What were some challenges? Uh, you know, when an actor's got great skills and prepared, it's a pleasure. When they're not prepared, it's a nightmare. I mean, uh, I love working with actors because, you know, it, with actors you make the words come alive and. Uh, uh, I'm not the greatest judge of actors. I need to see to believe. So when somebody auditions, it's when, when I look at their work, I can tell if I like it or not, but I can't tell if they're gonna be great in my movie until I actually see them and read them and, and compare them to other people. So you guys are probably better at judging it than, than me because I always have trouble. I read 20 people. I always have trouble until that one person comes in, it's like, that's why I had trouble. That person's the perfect person for it. 
and everybody else is we can't tell. So. All right, so any questions? I know there's got to be some out here. Let's go Peter first and then we'll go uh, How has your um, occupation or your job changed, if at all, uh, before and after you became a Christian? Well, When I became a Christian, and actually before I became a Christian, but it was around the same time, I said, I'm going to help people. I'm not going to ask for something in return. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to try to carve out a deal. I'm not going to see what's in it for me. If somebody comes and asks me for help, and I feel I have the capacity and the ability to help them, I will. Okay? So I've just been trying to give. And wouldn't you know it, just God has rained so much abundance upon me. It's an uncanny system of just let it go, plant those seeds. Who knows what's going to sprout? But I'm getting the harvest. So, at your age, I know it's hard to think that way, but paying it forward, always knowing that if you can help somebody, helping somebody doesn't change what's going to be on your table. I truly believe that, for the negative. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm astounded how uh, God operates. Um, So many, so many. I would discount it as coincidence or luck, but I truly believe that God had a had an eye on me long before I even knew Him. And um, uh, I just think that uh, I have so much to be grateful for, and I owe it all to Him. And I'm going to spend the rest of my days trying to repay him for everything. Um, and what that translates to is the giving love and compassion and trying not to be judgmental. And, um, so, yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, well, um, part of part of becoming a Christian was uh, not just reading the Bible, but about being part of the community. And I don't think you're. I, I needed to be around other Christians. I needed to escalate my learning, and to, uh, and the best way to do that was to, to find a church. Oh, so that was after your um, yeah, 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 yeah. Before? Are you kidding? <laughs> Football on Sundays. <laughs> so then I guess my question is then, what made you open? Like, was it the hospital experience? No, uh, we became Christians before the hospital experience. Uh, you know what, what? What made me open is that um, I had done my entire life my way, mm -hmm. and I knew my way just brought me addiction, depression, stress, and I surrendered. And you know, I, I had gone through, um, I had separated from my wife in 2004. It's been 11 years, and we're just getting the court documents signed. So I had been, um, I had been bombarded with the stress from, from this. And I had wanted to give her almost everything, but she had so much anger and hate in her that she just wanted to inflict, I can't tell you what she wanted, I can tell you what it felt like to me. That she just 
didn't want to let go and that she got some pleasure from seeing me in pain where I spent so much time with lawyers and accountants that literally I was, became homeless and I knew that everything was going to be fine and it has been. I needed to have sex or alcohol or romance or public adulation or gambling or something just to fill that emptiness. And as soon as God found me and I accepted him, I completely disappeared. It gave me freedom knowing that I was loved, knowing that I was not alone, that I was a sinner, that I was human, that, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, of course, I, I, sometimes I feel regret, but I realize that, that shame, I, I've repented, that, uh, that drowning myself in shame is just the devil's work to hold me back. Um, I needed, I needed. My ex-wife probably won't do that, and I can give her the power over me, um, and I pray for her all the time, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I feel free. I, I have no worries in the world because I, I've surrendered. I'm, I'm out of control. You know what happened? 
he's a great husband and great father. Not because she prayed him into it. Not because she was reading the Bible. But because she was walking the walk and talking to God. So the greatest gatherer of disciples are the ones that can embody what Christ has taught us. And when you do that, what I've learned is people run to you when they're in pain. People seek you out because you have a secret that they want and that they admire. So um, I, I was just amazed. I, I encouraged her to write a book. That's amazing. We all tend to condemn others and to blame others and to be also negative. And we have the power to, to thank him for all that we do have. We were hanging out with David yesterday, and um, we were talking about um, one of the best things that we can do as friends for one another is to seek after Christ as, as best we can. Sometimes it's not necessarily about just all these things we do for each other, but one thing is, um, as David follows Christ, I'm inspired by that, and that spurs me on to follow Christ too. As Teddy follows Christ, all these people are showing up at his Bible study. When the Bible study never existed, now there's 40 people saying, what? Teddy's a believer? Something must have happened. I want to know more. And that's, you know, I talked to someone right before this, and a lot of people have been really impacted by your testimony. Someone was a great example. He, he was jobless. And being the control freak I am, I like, wanted him to change his job strategy. And Carl also wanted it to change. And Sungmo just said to us, guys, just pray for him. Okay. So we just prayed for him. Two weeks later, he gets a job offer. And I was like, wow, what an what a incredible lesson. Or, you know, we had, uh, we had a lot of conflict in our Bible study recently. There were a couple people who were sort of like, <coughs> had the Holy Spirit in them and during Bible study and they couldn't control it and they were manifesting and <coughs> it was freaking everybody out and so we, we brought in a pastor who explained it all but there was still a lot of conflict and so we were supposed to Carl, Sungo and I were supposed to gather, gather everybody together one on one to work things out but Carl and Sungo went away and it was up to me and I was like uh, I'm the, the least I don't know what to do, so I just prayed about it and, and left it in God's hands. And we had the most incredible Bible study, and it just worked itself out. And I'm learning so much uh, every step I take. Is to say, He's so amazing, and I'm nothing. And if I just surrender, great things will happen. You want to decide? What's your relationship like with your family now, and what's your reaction been since you became Christian? Well, uh, my ex-wife, bad. <laughs> uh, they don't know I'm a Christian. My daughter's bad. They asked to take a hiatus from me because of the court case and until it was completed, and. Um, I respected that because they are, live with their mom and they're, they're, they're grown kids, but they, um, yeah. Um, but on my wife's side, um, her family is very Christian and this man, it's unbelievable. They, uh, they look at me differently and I'm, I'm proud now um, of not only taking care of Julia, but also being a member of the family and they have, uh, her sister has three sons, they're all about Christians, and I feel like they're my sons. And, you know, I, I didn't, had to go through losing my family uh, because of me, but God provided me a new family, new children, and uh, taking advantage of that. And I'm a godparent to two kids, and I treat that very seriously. 
and my Bible study is my family, and my brothers and sisters, uh, my relationship has never been better. Um, so two of them are not Christian, one is, and uh, I just, I can say I love you to them and mean it, and, and not be embarrassed about it. And, uh, so, it's been great. Jim. I will say this about Teddy, um, and I, I was reflecting on this. You have very loyal friends to you, and that uh, you are a loyal friend to others. Um, and I think of, I don't know them that well, like I think of like Welly and his wife, I think of Stephen and Linda, I think of uh, you know, Paul Song, the others, uh, people that have been loyal to you, that, but you've been loyal to them as well. It's funny because uh, Julia often says being Christian is very hard in this world. And I don't find it that hard because the alternative was always very hard for me. But my friends are hard partiers, hard drinkers. They go out to Notabon or karaoke and they, <laughs> they're married and they stay out till two in the morning and they get, they pay girls to come sit with them and they do all these terrible things things that I might have used to have done, and I don't go, and I don't talk the same way, and I don't do the same thing, but it was really important to me, because I love them, to not judge them, and to let them know that I've changed, but what my love for them has only grown. And it's been incredible because in the beginning it was more like, do I drink or do I not drink? And it's like, it's not, it's not important. The important thing is, am I there for them and am I going to help them and do they help me? And, um, so it was a challenge, it was an adjustment. And the people who are turned off by me being Christian, you know, I, I pray for them. But nobody's turned off by them. And actually, I have really close friends that are PKs that I never really knew. I mean, I, I knew them for eight years, and now they come to my Bible study, and it's like, I never had any clue who they were inside, what their struggles were, what their faith was like, and it's been tremendous. So it, it's only made my relationships much, much deeper because I chose to do them. How would you describe Christianity and Christianity and I don't know. That's a great question because I don't try to seek out people who are Christians in entertainment. I try to seek out Christians. And I go to my church and uh, but I, I think uh, the thing about it is uh, people who are in entertainment probably need it more than anybody. Uh, I, everybody needs it, but it brings out the worst in people. It really does. Like if you want to be famous, you want to make money, you want to have everybody adore you, those are, those are really enabling, just horrible horrible values, uh, twisted values. So I think it's, uh, uh, you, you raise a great question. And, uh, I don't think people discriminate against Christians in entertainment, but I don't think people are that vocal about it. Uh, I'm pretty vocal about it now. along with that in the podcast he talked about you know I can ask you is there a cost um, is there a cost to following Christ in this industry you know? like I said I've been rewarded with such abundance by by God that of course there are costs but the benefits far outweigh the cost so I I, I don't even dwell on what the costs are I don't because my life is so much better 
I'm so free to be me. You know, I, I can, I'm, I'm okay in my own skin. And that's a miracle. So what cost did that? Whatever costs. So, you know, I'm, I'm on the second half of my life. I, um, I know that I trust in him. I know that he has a plan for me and everything's going to work. And, and I do believe that it helps being 58 to finally surrender. But when I was your age, I, I think it would be a much greater challenge because all the temptations and uh, the world around you is such a great influence on you. I, I've done it all. I've tasted it all. I've sinned in every way imaginable. And uh, it doesn't hold as much power over me anymore. Not that I am sin free, of course not. I wish I could relate to what it would be like for you, but I, I can't. Um, yeah, my stuff is similar to Will's, but uh, another question um, I had was uh, uh, because I've been hearing that the, the Lord is uh, planning to do a lot of things and in Hollywood, he sees it in Hollywood. Uh, because it's such a strong for uh, influence uh, over the nation. From your perspective, what kind of influences have you seen uh, on the nation? Uh, Can you be more specific? Yeah, uh, I, I get it. Um, not a lot. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you what What I see. I see Hillsong. Hillsong United. Mm -hmm. YouTube, where young people are accepting Jesus because the door is opened in unconventional ways. I see Jubilee Project projecting positive values. And so the tools are there. It may not come from the establishment, but it comes from media and being able to touch people. <coughs> and. Uh, so I think technology actually is the greatest. Uh, it's also enabled a lot of addiction, porn, and terrible things. But yeah, great tool to spread the gospel. Any final question, Shin, and then I'm gonna have Teddy close with one final thought. Um, first of all, I just want to say like you are actually a really good storyteller. Mm -hmm. When you said that earlier, and I was like. I was kind of skeptical, but you are. <laughs> <laughs> you really are. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank you for your humility. Um, someone who's as accomplished as you are, to uh, have this attitude of like you're always learning and you're not perfect, and it's, it's really real and it's inspiring to me, and I'm sure others too. Uh, so the question, uh, I don't really know how to ask it without maybe risking offending you, but uh, <laughs> uh, so if you, if you like jumped the time machine and went back a few decades and you were here in this group, what is what is something you might want to see more of or less of? I guess in other words, like if you, what kind of advice would you have for a group such as this? Uh, we're all a bunch of young people who are trying to you know, make life work. Uh, we're trying to make Christianity work. We're trying to understand God. Like, is there something that you could see that like maybe we could do or mindset that we could adopt? Well, I'm a little stuck on how I might be offended by that. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that you're not, I'm glad. Huh? Because I was... Yeah, because you were... Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think the way you all look at it is like, if you were to talk to a younger yes. self, yes. you're going to say something. Oh. <laughs> 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 you know, how dare you, Shen? <laughs> No, I, you know, um, I, I, the, the control freak in me realizes something. That as much as I want to tell you what to do with your lives, it's, it's the stupidest instinct in me. What I need to do is to answer any of your questions and support you and love you. And uh, everybody has to go through their own journey. In their own way, and unfortunately, make your own mistakes. 
And I do believe that making mistakes and suffering is all part of the journey. And not even in just the religious context, but <coughs> failure in business is a necessary ingredient for you to achieve and move forward. And if you don't have failure, you're not living life. So, I forget what passage is in the Bible. I'm not great with the memory, but God didn't promise you uh, a peaceful world. God promised you that in this crazy world where a lot of crazy things are going, that He would help you find peace. And so, a lot of it is going to be trial and error. And what you're able to stomach and, and absorb and to live with. That's the hardest thing is to be on point 24-7, having that relationship with God. And it's just not realistic that it's going to be that way. So I say find your way. Lean on each other. Be a family. Be loving. Don't judge each other. Um, and be vulnerable. And I, I'm going to tell you, if I were me 30 years ago, if I had a group like this, of people who were loving and supportive, maybe I wouldn't have to stumble the way I did. So when I first walked in here, I told Shin, I said, I, I think it's, I, I'm so gratified this, to see uh, a room full of young Christians on a Thursday night, gathering for fellowship. You know, this is not a club, this is not a movie, this is, you're choosing to spend your time with each other. And that's so gratifying. The only thing more gratifying might be at the end of every church service where the pastor says, if you've decided to give your life to Christ, please come on down and we'll pray for you. And that gets me every time. So, um, I wish I had you guys, but my wish has come true because I do have you guys here. And I hope that I can learn from you going forward and that, uh, you know, um, I, I really appreciate you being so open and, uh, and welcome. So thank you. So Teddy, I, I don't know how many public prayers you've done, but we would be honored if, if you would pray for us to close this out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Father God, how amazing are you to bring this beautiful group together? To give such comfort and love to each and every one of us. Um, Father God, I ask you to raise your shield of protectiveness and Keep this family strong and have them go out into the world and make disciples and love each other and protect them. And God, it's just uh, just so overwhelming to, to feel the Holy Spirit here working and to be accepted and to have that freedom to, to just worship you and love you. So, Father God, I hope you can take care of these young people. They're, they're so faithful. They're, they're committed to you. They stumble, they fall, but they get back up and they look to you, God. And, and please, um, I, I want to give special prayers to uh, Stephen, Pastor Stephen, who, you know, we, we, we tend to look at our pastors and our leaders in a different way than each other. And uh, you know he's as human as the rest of us and he has the same kinds of failings and sins and failures and fears and but we all look to him for such strength and support and, and Father God we hope that you just wrap your arms around him and take care of him and, and heal him and his heart and his health and, and every which way and, uh, um, and just personally I'm so grateful to be included here with such wonderful people in the name of Jesus I pray Amen. Amen.
we chipped in and we got you a Bible with, I, I, I'm sure you have one, but we got one with your name on it. And that's wow. Your name um, and then I know, we, we know that you like to run. So we got you one of these. You may have one, but it's a, a Fitbit oh, to keep cool. charge of your heart rate and make sure you're healthy. And, <laughs> and you can, we, we can compare you know, running and everything like that too. So Great. that's our, our gift to you. So love you, buddy. Thank you.